Right. Good morning, everybody. Good evening for those who are in Europe, and uh, I guess almost good night for those who are in Asia. Um, my name is uh, Nerius Poshkus, and I've been, I am your presenter today to talk about rough waters ahead, ocean freight mar navigating the ocean freight market in 2018. Like I said, my name is Nerius. I am heading Ocean Free Product uh, at Blackport. I joined the company roughly three and a half years ago. This is my 10th RFP season negotiating Ocean Free contracts. Previously, I was uh, at Cunanago for six and a half years. All right, so before we head into 2019, I would like to share one of the main highlights of 2018 because that sets the tone for this year and actually the following years. So what happened last year? Trans-Pacific specifically had quite a roller coaster year when it comes to ocean freight. The first half of the year was plagued by overcapacity. That was actually was globally. Carrier financials were very poor. A lot of them actually lost a lot of money. Some reported close to half a billion dollars loss in the, the first half of the year. Contracts that carriers signed with large BCOs last year, and those were signed about May 2018, because typically Trans-Pacific negotiations go, um, they don't go from January through January, they go from May through May. So, those were concluded at lower than carriers expected rates. They were not satisfactory, and that resulted in even more dissatisfaction and bad results for ocean carriers. So what they have done is they said, all right, enough is enough. We have to reduce capacity. It seems like the market isn't doing so well. And they announced a series of blind sailings and service cancellations. Almost at the same time, maybe roughly a month later, Trump announced the first round of tariffs at 10%. So that caused some panic in the market and importers were thinking, all right, let's import more goods, especially the ones that are obviously impacted by the tariffs. Let's, impact, let's import more goods than I need simply to avoid the tariffs. And who knows, there may be around two and around three, and obviously those, as we know today, were also announced. So all of a sudden, demand picked up. But if you remember what I said at the beginning, supply has been significantly reduced. So that set the tone for second half of the year, which essentially was an absolute chaos. Um, at first, because of all the surging demand, carriers were seeing huge equipment shortages in, uh, say, Shanghai, Qingdao, and actually all over China, simply because, again, there was more demand. Demand was picking up so much that the carriers simply couldn't deal with it anymore. So what they decided to do is they added about 30 extra loaders to the market. An extra loader is simply an extra ship that is deployed to deal with surging demand. So all these extra loaders were added to the market to arrive by January 1, 2019 to beat a third wave of announced tariffs of 25% that was going to affect a huge portion of the importers. Once those ships were on the water, they slowly started arriving in Los Angeles. And as you can imagine, what happens when you add so many extra ships to a port that is already somewhat congested? Los Angeles has always been running close to at capacity. This created a lot of congestion in Los Angeles. So much congestion that I have barely seen this in the last 10 years. Some terminals had so much freight and the vessels kept coming that they simply were loading containers, newly arrived containers, on top of the containers that were sitting in the port already for, say, weeks. I have seen actually cases where 
containers were not transferred to BNSF or UP rail companies because that portion was also congested because the infrastructure couldn't deal with so much extra um, containers. Uh, up to 45 days. So obviously this it impacted uh, a lot of importers. At the same time, long-term contracts were strictly managed by carriers. As you can imagine, because supply was still somewhat uh, small compared to demand, right? It wasn't balanced. So carriers started seeing huge price increases on spot market. A spot market is where you essentially don't have a contract commitment for a full year, so your prices may go up and down based on supply and demand. So those prices almost tripled in September compared to, so say, February, as per Shanghai Containerized Index. Long-term contract holders, like I said, they were very strictly managed. Space was very strictly managed, right? They were not getting any additional allocation for any cargo that was above their allocations. In some cases, they even had to pay extra for cargo within the allocations, simply because the contracts were not very clear. They didn't specify what space was available for a clients. Let's see what else. All right. Uh, at the same time, warehouses started filling up, and uh, some BCOs or large importers started using containers as storage facilities. As you can imagine, if you start doing that, that means containers are no longer being returned to the port and seeing, being sent back to China. So that contributed to additional challenges in, uh, in Asia in terms of equipment shortages. Let's keep going. Um, fuel prices at the same time were going up. As you can see, this graph shows uh, IFO 380, the Rotterdam uh, index. Prices went up from, uh, say, 360 or so to over 500 um, in November. So that increased carrier costs even more so. Why I'm saying all of this? Um, because of all the unreliability, companies, ocean free carriers. They smelled an opportunity that, all right, there is a niche for premium services. Like how can I create more value for my clients? Maybe there is a terminal that is less congested. Maybe I can add smaller vessels. So APL actually announced two or even three premium services. There were different levels of premium services and I'm not gonna get into the details on this webinar. And those were successfully introduced in the market. They were used to avoid congestion because the ships were, uh, sorry, the premium containers were top loaded in the ship, offloaded directly on chassis and could leave the terminal, not without any issues, but with many less issues than they would see otherwise. So this sums last year. Coming to 2019, it's very important to look at the fundamentals, like what is actually happening in the market before we make any predictions or we give you any advice. So. We have gone from an old economy to a new economy, um, but supply chain still hasn't kept up. In terms of infrastructure, in terms of data, in terms of, like I mentioned, there is not enough premium services in the market, and reliability in the ocean freight market last year actually was at all time lows. Only 30 few percent of the ships arrived on time. Now, couple that with people used to be fine with, let's say, three-week delivery windows when you used to buy things online years ago. Now, they're fully in control and they want their goods tomorrow or, in some cases, in two hours. That creates a lot of challenges for importers simply because they have to either keep more inventory in the United States because, again, they can't deal with unreliability. They don't really know when their goods can arrive. Or they need to find another ways of importing, right? Whether it's air freight, whether it's premium motion services or some kind of combination of both. That's why 
we're saying like as a fundamental, there are more differentiated services that are going to be introduced in the market. Carriers keep consolidating. That has been happening for quite a while now. Last year, K-Line, MOL, and NYK formed the joint venture, and now it's called OAE, or Ocean Network Express. APL is now fully integrated into CMA, and CMA Group actually owns them. Um, we think that consolidation will continue, and this is not a prediction, it's just a fundamental of a fact. Carrier capacity for this year, this is global, is actually staying static, so carriers are not adding uh, extra space. Since there are less players in the market, like I said, carriers are consolidating, they are better at managing capacity, which means if services are in full, instead of dropping prices, very often ocean carriers would simply cancel a service, announce a blank sailing, reduce the size of the vessel when they can. Basically, they're becoming more data-driven and intelligent when it comes to balancing supply and demand. Important thing is also, uh, carrier costs are going up this year. I'm not necessarily predicting that prices are going up. That's a topic we're going to discuss in a few minutes. But it's important to know that as a fundamental for ocean carriers, their costs are going up. Very simple reason why fuel costs have went through the roof. Recently, they went down slightly, but still, they're a lot higher than they used to be. And that brings another topic is IMO 220. For those who are not familiar, what is IMO 220 is um, all the ships globally today uh, are using quite a dirty bunker oil uh, that has 3.5% or less sulfur. It's actually quite dirty. If you touch it with your hand, you could see your hand would, uh, would be quite dark. So IMO changed requirements globally for all containerized companies as well, actually for all ships, commercial ships, including cruises. So as of January 2020, all ships will have to change from 3.5% to 0.5% sulfur, which is very important. Why? One, there is not enough supply today of the new and clean fuel. Two, it is expensive. Today, it's actually twice more expensive than a regular bunker oil is being used today. Three, there are many ways to comply with IMO 220 regulations. One, like very simple one, obviously, is simply buy clean fuel. Second one is install a scrubber. And you can have two types of scrubbers, open water or closed loop. Installing a scrubber is one, very expensive, Two, takes a long time, four to eight weeks. Three, there are only four to five places globally where you can install a scrubber. So it's going to be quite difficult for carriers to do that. And they cannot choose really when to install a scrubber simply because a lot of carriers would like to install them. The actual ROI is expected to be slightly better, at least at the beginning, if you have a vessel equipped with the scrubbers because you can still use old oil. Demand for old oil may be going down, so the prices may be, be even lower than they are today for the old oil. So the carriers that can install scrubbers may have a financial advantage for a little bit. Another important thing to know about the scrubbers is, again, if you're installing a scrubber and it takes your ship out of a rotation for four to eight weeks, and in some cases, maybe even more, that reduces capacity globally. So let's say 8% of global ships are equipped with scrubbers. That means 8% of global ships would be removed from the service for eight weeks, four weeks, let's say on average six, so more than 10%. So that's a huge capacity reduction. Couple that with capacity not being increased, we may actually see capacity reduction for 
effective capacity in the market for 2019 and 2020. Slower transit times is another effect to the market. Why so? Is if the fuel is very expensive, let's say today fuel is roughly 30% of the carrier's cost for a shipment moving from Shanghai, let's say to Rotterdam. It's slightly less if you're moving to Chicago because rail portion is moving the rail. If that fuel goes up by, if it doubles, obviously, then the, the cost for fuel is also going through the roof. Just like driving a car is more efficient at 55 miles an hour than it is at 70 miles an hour. And for those in Europe, um, you can do the math. <laughs> um, Ships can also go slightly slower to save fuel. That not only that it saves fuel, but it also reduces capacity. So if you're going at a lower speed, instead of let's say eight ships required to be on a rotation, where ships are leaving Shanghai every seven days, you now may need nine. The last effect for IMO220 is potentially lower reliability, and that is quite simple. Why is Blank sailings, again, when you are installing a scrubber, you need to remove a ship from capacity, which means the services may have simply be less reliable for that simple reason. And that's up on IMO220. If you want to ask more questions about it, we can do that at the very end. All right, this section is more relevant to companies that are signing contracts, larger contracts for one year, in May 1. I just wanted to give you some advice because I've done this. This is, uh, like I said, my 10th year negotiating contracts with the uh, carriers and, and uh, importers. And I've seen how others do it. I've seen, you know, what the pitfalls. So before you sign a commitment, make sure you discuss with your forwarder what is actually your commitment besides an MQC when MQC is a minimum quantity commitment? Typically, companies don't talk about anything but the minimum quantity commitment. They say, how many TUs do you want to give me? In exchange, you give me the price. This is an old world. This is why shipping is so unreliable and you end up paying more in peak season or you simply don't know really what to expect. It has to be a lot more clear as to like how many TEUs of containers do you actually commit on a weekly basis, monthly basis? What happens if you don't deliver? Will your capacity be cut? Again, those are questions that have to be answered or at least discussed before you commit your volume to something else. There are so many, I'm not going to list names, but there are so many companies that will be throwing the rates out there that are very low because today's spot market is cheap, fixed prices are higher they would be taking opportunities. The opportunity is if the market stays low, I'm making a lot of money, the market picks up, I will find something like a terms and conditions in my contract that says I no longer have to keep my price, I can raise it or I don't have space. So watch out for this. Another question you should ask is what happens if a carrier, not a forwarder, but a carrier discontinues the service? Let's say you sign with somebody for 500 TUs from Shanghai to New York. A forwarder gave you a very good rate. It looked great, better than everybody else. You committed your 500 TUs. They told you your capacity is maxed at 10 TUs a week. What they didn't tell you is they only had one carrier choice. And if that carrier, let's say carrier X, no longer has that service, and they decided that the service needs to be canceled in September because loading factors were not great. A forwarder may have something in their terms and conditions that says, I no longer have to keep that price because it's subject to space availability and it's subject to carrier continuing the service. I would recommend to go for at least multiple carrier options or make sure you do discuss if it is only one carrier option that the risk is clear. It does, I'm, I'm not saying the forwarder should be taking the risk, or you should but it should be agreed in advance, and people typically don't discuss this. A third advice is, what BAF formula is applicable? BAF is fuel. Right? Because of IMO 220, carrier BAF or ocean fuel costs are going up very significantly as of Q4, actually, 2019, simply because the vessel strains are much longer than uh, 
um, sorry, they're like 100 days long in some cases, right? So the ships are leaving Shanghai early and they have to load with, uh, or they have to refuel with clean fuel earlier. So make sure you do discuss this because again, some people may simply have something in terms of conditions saying your costs may go up and they will go up in Q4, but that form will have to be somewhat agreed in advance of discuss. You don't want to be exposed where people implement their own fuel charges that may be even higher than carrier charges simply because they're again taking risks on your supply chain. The last thing is, is space guaranteed in peak season. Um, and how is this guaranteed? And what happens if your cargo gets rolled? And like, how many rolls can you expect? Very simple question. Most of the people will tell you that there are no guarantees in sea freight, but all right, that's fine. How much cargo do you expect to, to see to get rolled? Is it 5%, is it 10%, or is it 2%? And even if it is not a very hard commitment, it should be a KPI that you should be watching and you should be measuring. Um, Oh, I actually covered this already. Behind the scenes, so there are quite a few companies, spoilers, like I said, that are taking risks, and uh, that's very simple. What, what does it mean is you, as a forwarder, I've seen a few companies, what they do is they would give you a price and they don't have a carrier's backing, and then once they get you a business, they go to a carrier and try to get coverage. In some cases they do, and then everything is fine. In some cases they don't. That's a little bit of gambling and you don't want to gamble your supply chain. So make sure again you ask them, is this actually covered with a carrier? How many carriers, how many alliances? It's very important. Um, I also covered space commitment and this actually says equipment too. So make sure that it, what happens if there is no equipment in Asia? Is it forwarder's responsibility to find a carrier that has equipment or are you exposed? And the last one is watch out for hidden fees. Um, many companies still have a lot of hidden fees. They don't necessarily discuss them. It simply says that space, again, subject to equipment availability, subject to space availability, and if they no longer can fulfill it, they may come back to you and ask for more money and they will find something in their terms and conditions. So again, just watch out for this. All right, a few predictions I'm gonna make before I open up for questions for future markets. So. Customers like will have even higher expectations, which will result in ocean freight market adapting and changing to more guaranteed services, more premium services, as well as actually deferred services. So if my expectation is if I'm importing Christmas trees in summer and I don't pay Christmas trees and I don't need them until say November, I can use the cheapest available service that can roll three times. I don't care as an importer, all I want is the cheap price. The other client may be wanting something that must arrive on time. So ocean freight market is definitely going to become more differentiated than it is today. Two is at some point, I would say anywhere between 220 and 225, all of the ocean freight contracts will be performance based. It will be no longer a discussion, do I have space? How many carriers are there? It will be agreed at the beginning of the contract. What is your commitment? What is forwarder's commitment? What's the transit time KPI? And the system will have to manage allocations, manage space for you and the rest. So that is definitely coming. Increased rate volatility. Um, you may see prices going up and down more than you are used to. And last year, actually, prices were very volatile. They kept going up and then now they crashed and they will go up again. The reason being is, Scrubber installations, like I said, are taking out capacity, and like if you are taking out a ship outside of rotation, supply and demand is imbalanced, prices go up, then you put that ship back in the market, prices go down. So again, expect more volatility for non-contracted rates. I also expect more carrier consolidation. Um, today we have 10, 12 carriers, and um, I'm talking about global large carriers. Uh, 10 years ago we had 20 plus. We had four alliances, actually five before that. Um, today we have three. I expect the carriers will continue consolidating. We will see no more than seven to nine. Some people say maybe five, but I think that's a little bit aggressive. And higher fuel charges, I move to 20, as well as simply a more expensive fuel because it costs more money to produce clean fuel. So, 
these are my predictions and hopefully useful advices for you. It's kind of a last minute, but I know a lot of people are negotiating contracts and uh, they are about to sign and commit for, for next year. So let's open this up for questions. Blockchain. Oh, <laughs> nice question. So I got a question about what is my opinion about blockchain? Uh, I personally think blockchain is uh, a buzzword. It, it wouldn't work until, it's not going to work until data is 100% reliable and uh, there's still too much human touch, people attaching the data and it's not a closed loop. So to me it's more about digitizing infrastructure, creating data products than, than blockchain. I think those will come years before the blockchain. I see another question. When will we see the impacts for IMO 220? Oh, I kind of mentioned it. So IMO 220 will take effect, like I said earlier, than January 2020. It's likely to affect the market as early as Q4 2019. And for those companies that are signing long-term contracts, you could say it's affecting your contract negotiations, uh, negotiations today. All right, one more question. What is your opinion on index-linked contracts? Yeah, that's actually a great tool for people that are not, the people that don't want to be checking them forwarders and see if they're competitive. It's actually a great tool again to make sure that you are, that you don't need to check and you know you're paying the right price. So if your volumes are not more than, let's say, 500 containers a year, depends. Uh, but you still want to have some stability and you don't want to be pricing every single shipment out. This is actually a very good idea. Um, technology at some point will be built for the index link contracts. And uh, yeah, I definitely see that is uh, happening. I personally would like to see that as soon as possible. Do you anticipate Brexit having any impact on pricing this year? So for US, definitely, no, say not definitely, but it should not affect anything for United States. For Europe, it's, it's not necessarily affecting your ocean freight prices. It's more likely to affect say possibly customs if there is no deal all of a sudden you may need to clear customs to move a shipment from um, France to UK so that's definitely something that people should watch out for another question is how much concern is there over the China trade given the volatility of the US and China very good question so today, for Asia, Trans-Pacific imports to the United States, China is about 70% of U.S. trade in Trans-Pacific. This is huge compared to the population, even the size of the economy. So it's, I would say it's disproportionately large. We're seeing already that in Q1, import genius data appears U.S. Customs Manifest data essentially shows that there is already some shift happening and the data that I've seen latest, not in the media but myself, was 68%. So they lost a little bit. Is it because of its front loading? It's unclear and I think the actual data, the public data is coming out uh, either actually today or this weekend. So we'll see. But there is a worry obviously for China I would say for the ocean shipping, it's not, I would say not that important. Obviously, it is important, but the carriers will adapt. Let's say the shift has been happening already before the trade wars to Southeast Asia. China is simply getting more expensive. The salaries are going up and simply the economy is getting better. So Southeast Asia has been attractive for quite a while. Vietnam is growing exponentially. Cambodia is growing, Indonesia, all of these countries. 
Um, you are actually seeing it by ocean free carriers adding additional services to those areas. So example would be five years ago, Vietnam did not have direct services to the United States. Today, you not only have Ho Chi Minh City direct to the east coast of US, Europe, west coast, you also have in brand new services by Ocean Alliance from High Fog to Los Angeles and Oakland, as well as High Fong to Seattle, Tacoma, and Vancouver by the Alliance. And we need to have like Lloyd and Yangming. So carriers are shifting. They will shift anywhere where you shift. Um, another question. Has there been any discussion at Flexport over Amazon Freight? Should be an interesting competitor entering the market. So for me, it's actually quite simple. We don't see Amazon as a direct competitor. Yes, they are creating and they have their own freight department and uh, they're moving freight, but 10% or so of our freight actually moves to Amazon warehouses. And to my knowledge, take it as my own personal knowledge because I would like to verify it, is Amazon is only moving freight for people selling or buying on Amazon. And there's the whole universe of brands and consumers outside of that universe that also need solutions like Flexport and other companies, right? So like, even if Amazon grows and they do take that over somehow, again, there's so much more to do than just Amazon. So we focus on growth. Right, we're kind of running out of time. Oh, I see one more question. What is Flexport's value proposition to customers? So our value proposition to customers is transparency, is customer service, is digital data, is bringing everybody to one operating system for global trade and making it more reliable where all companies, importers, exporters, ocean carriers, at some point airlines, warehouses, and uh, even custom brokerage are on one platform. Data is all structured. And uh, on that platform, people can conduct global trade. And we are working to create more data products, more reliability, and again, bring more transparency to allow to shift. And I'm going to pivot a little bit to the ocean freight because that's where I'm an expert. Today, ocean freight is, let's say, estimated arrivals is what you get when you book ocean freight. What I want to create through data is from an estimated arrival to delivery windows, like say Amazon had a few years ago, if you order something online, it would give you a delivery window a few days to guarantee deliveries in a few years. That's what I see us building in the future. And there's obviously a lot more value proposition. I don't want to get into more details because I'm an ocean expert. But when it comes to ocean uh, for us, we are going to give you access to every single service that exists globally at competitive rates. And at, I wouldn't say no roles, depending on what you book, delivered as promised and above. So if you book the product that is subject to role, then you will deliver as promised. If you book the premium product that you need to de it delivered to the warehouse by that date, then we're going to deliver. So that is our promise when it comes to the ocean trade. And no hidden fees, no transparency. All right, we are out of time. So I truly appreciate everybody's questions. And again, hope it was useful. If you do want to ask me additional questions, my name is Nerius, uh, N-E-R-I-J-U-S, Nerius at flexport.com. Appreciate it and have a great day.